Yeah, also for the first part, I'm gonna just be using the board and then I'll, I'll do some live coding after. Um, but yeah, how's everyone doing on the project so far? Who's finished the project? Hands up. All right, you still have time. Um, I'll put some logistics on the board. So I've been just progressively updating the syllabus as, as things might change and also Canvas for like the due dates. Um, but as I mentioned last time, project one is due on Monday, but it's, um, it's gonna be due in the morning. So you have the weekend, but it's gonna be due at 9 a.m. And the reason it's due at nine is that the critiques are still the same original due date um, Tuesday, right before class. So and these are updated in the project one just description itself. And there's also questions to answer in the critique. When I bring the projectors down and go through and, and do the live coding, I'll just walk through the question. There's basically stuff we've talked about already, like kind of deconstructing the visual encodings, what worked well, what didn't work well, and giving just feedback. Um, I haven't ever used Canvas's pure critique feedback. Um, so I'm gonna set that up. Um, tonight or tomorrow and see how it goes. And then if people do it and it works successfully, um, maybe message me, I'll, I'll send details out, but it appears I can just assign every one of you to other students in the class and Canvas handles all of the feedback and stuff. Um, have you guys used that for other classes? All right, well, in theory, it should work. Um, in practice, uh, to be determined. Um, Also, exciting, um, exciting news, video playlist is up. Um, so if you have been wanting to, to see the lecture videos, they've been on YouTube, but they weren't really organized. So now if you go to the, um, the syllabus, there's a link just in that nav bar. There's like the syllabus, the notes link, the videos link. That should have all of the videos in order. Um, I tried to do a, a bit of just like minor editing so that a lot of the like waiting while you ask questions is cut out and all of the boring stuff. So it's a little bit more condensed um, and there's notes for, for each of those. Uh, questions before we, uh, we get into the grammar of graphics. Question? All right. Um, so today we're going to talk about in, in the lecture portion, this theory that I've been mentioning a lot. It's this thing that people hear mainly because ggplot and they say, oh, ggplot, what's gg? It's the grammar of graphics. It's some way to think about charts, but what does it actually mean and why do we care? Um, throw a hand up if you've actually dived into like what the grammar of graphics is. Do you want to give like a one sentence of what the grammar of graphics is? Um, I mean, uh, I guess how, how do you define graphical elements so that you can talk about Yeah, no, that, that's that's a good. Uh, 
a good one, one or a few sentences. Um, so the grammar of graphics, I like to think, exists along the spectrum. Or over here, we have really specific. And over here, we have broad. The, um, the benefit of having something that's very specific, like thinking about visual encodings, thinking about colors and shapes and lines and all these like very, um, I guess, fine-grained visual aspects of a chart, is that you can talk really um, critically about visualizations, but it might be too verbose. And, and the analogy I use is this visual encodings is like having a much larger vocabulary in terms of writing an essay. If you read an academic paper, there's a lot of words that you may not understand, even though they might be better at conveying very specific things about the specific subject matter. It might be harder for the general populace to interpret. Um, on one end, you have charts. This is something like you might read a New York Times article. They talk about events maybe um, related to some scientific discovery in very broad terms, which it's very accessible, but you can only talk at a certain level of detail here. Um, and that's kind of what charts are. When we say scatter plot, when we say line plot, we can't really say much more besides that. And the only information it conveys are things like what's on the X, what's on the Y, what, what shapes do we use? But the grammar of graphics, I think, exists in this really nice in-between of visual encodings being maybe too specific, charts being too broad. And the essentials are basically just um, ways to describe a chart. in terms of their component elements. And um, this is actually a really powerful thing um, to be able to decompose these charts. And I'm going to go through some examples of what this looks like in, in code and um, why we actually care. But uh, before we look at the code, um, the other thing is if you are wondering about the specifics of like an implementation of the grammar of graphics, it started off as this very um, broad academic uh, book, essentially, that was a theory. And no one really implemented it until Hadley Wickham and the grammar of graphics. So it was this thing that people conceptually liked, and then Hadley Wickham came along and he said, I'm going to create an R package and make it something that we can actually apply. Um, and a lot of other libraries have been inspired by these ideas, um, including D3, even though D3 isn't an implementation of this. Um, D3 is probably more on the specific side here. Uh, this is, I would say, ggplot. And then this is, I would say, like Seaborn or Pend is even. Um, and in this, this grammar, um, Hadley Wickham, or actually uh, the initial pass, uh, was by this guy, Leland Wilkinson. in his book that's just titled Grammar of Graphics. And this came out, uh, when was it? Around 1999. And then uh, I'll say implementation. was with Hadley Wickham. And he added this additional um, idea where he called a layered grammar of graphics. 
And this was, when was it? 2010. And in Leland's layered grammar of graphics, um, the main elements uh, to start was uh, defining a given layer. And you can imagine in something like a regression plot, you have one layer that's the circles, you have another layer that's the regression line, you have another layer that's the confidence bounds. Um, that's strangely why R has like really beautiful regression plots and Python doesn't, is that the grammar of graphics had just a big influence, not only in ggplot, but in the R community as a, as a whole. And each layer um, had these components that uh, should sound similar to things that we, we um, have encountered in D3. There's geometric elements, which are typically referred to as, as geoms. There is what he calls statistical transforms. And who can just think off the top of their head, what might a statistical transform be that we apply to some raw data to then visualize it in a better way? So log is actually, I'll mention uh, a separate element is scales. Um, log could be a little bit of both, but let's say log actually falls under scales. Other statistical transforms. Mm -hmm. So this is like normalizing, aggregating. Um, I would even say like regression lines fall in this. So this is more advanced statistical transforms than things like just scaling your axes. Um, and there's position. And then um, kind of related to position is the aesthetic. And this is what's typically, um, so in ggplot, there's AES, which is the aesthetic. You have things like aesthetic um, representing some column as a histogram. You have geoms, you have circles, you have squares, you have lines. Um, statistical transforms are things like aggregation. And even I would say, um, we can think of a histogram as a bar chart with a statistical transform that's a count. So a histogram is just line plus count. Um, and you can see the power in these. Um, there's an infinite in theory, not infinite, but there's a, a very large number of possible charts you can make. And the grammar of graphics through this somewhat elegant decomposition of charts as a whole makes it so that you can have these composable elements. So you don't have to know the laundry list of possible charts. You just have to understand how each of these can be combined to get this larger number of charts. Uh, and then I'll, I'll make some more room for myself. In addition to scales, which um, you'll start seeing names in this that are just functions in D3 and that, that's no accident. Um, there's scales, there's coordinate space. And the last kind of one is uh, facets. There's a few more, but these are kind of the main, the main ones. And um, these actually intentionally are under, under layer. And those are at the same like global level as layer. Um, why, why wouldn't we put scales as a subcategory of the given layer? Or things like the, the coordinate space. The coordinate space in this case being polar coordinates versus X and Y Cartesian coordinates versus some other mathematical coordinate space that you might want to visualize. Can you think of a a contradictory example of why scales um, or coordinates or even facets won't work as a layer. Uh, 
oh, so facets are, you typically see them as what's called small multiples. Um, so a facet is just something where you have a larger grid, and then it's usually broken up into maybe four subgrids. And this might be um, like something like age and gender, where this is uh, like female, male, and this is like adult and child. So facets are just ways to subcategorize the data and apply the same visual aesthetic to it. So these line charts all should look the same. And it's basically aggregated. Is it a female child, a male child, a adult female, or an adult male? Um, why can't we do this with layers? What would it mean uh, to put another facet on top of this? Could I put another facet? Could I also say I want to have a separate layer that facets age versus um, something like state? And why, why would it mess it up? Uh, you can add layers to the graph because you can have the same scales and like the same axes and like show multiple things on it. But like on the same graph, if you split it into like four or seven or four or seven or eight parts, or you don't want to like do layers or splits, right? Like it does not, it won't, <laughs> you won't be able to uh, convey these. Yeah, I guess the 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 <laughs> word I was looking for is that um, these are typically thought of as like global properties of a chart. And this, I would say, is um, local in a sense. So you can imagine for this, we have this global facet that facets on adult, child, female, male. And then we also can imagine that each one of these um, might potentially have two or three layers. So each facet could be a line with uh, scatter plot on it. And this is what we had last, last um, lecture. We had a line chart with a scatter plot overlaid so that we can see the individual points as well as the trend. Um, so each of those would be thought of as a layer. Um, and then these scales, it doesn't really make sense. Sometimes you see like a double y-axis, and that's one case where you might have multiple scales in, in different layers. Um, but in general, that's the, the high-level distinction. Does anyone have any, any questions on these components? Um, I'm going to go to the code so we can actually see what this looks like in a little bit more practical sense. Are these, um, is the possibility to combine these clear to people? How might we get a, how might we get a radial plot? And a radial plot, um, sometimes it's called like an aster plot or, or a few other names. It's these things that look like kind of a pie chart, but it usually has wedges of various widths and also uh, radii. So how might we get something that kind of looks like this through, I, I'm telling you that we can get this through a combination of those basic um, elements from the grammar of graphics. 
what elements are we going to need for our scales here? I guess scales in this case, you think of them um, a little bit one level more abstract than radius. Um, so a scale is simply a function that takes an input domain and maps it to an output domain. So you can have scales in theory just by thinking of, of lines, and you don't actually need to think of any of the visual encodings. So all a scale in, in this grammar graphics is similar to D3 is we take an input number, we apply some mapping, and we get an output number. Um, would it work to just use like a linear scaling? Yeah, I guess let's uh, let's write out what what are the transforms we need to do, and then we can map them to the grammar graphics. So you said we need a radius, we need an angle. Anything else we need? <laughs> the the width yeah uh, yeah so I guess that's let's say for this case that yeah let's just say that's constant for simplicity in this one also let's say there aren't any facets because it's just they're all one group um, statistical transforms not really any What's the aesthetic or geometry we use in this one? So bars, bars is the correct answer. Um, knowing that the geometry is bars, can you think of what you combine bars with to get this? Yes, polar coordinates and bars is the correct answer. Um, so all of you were, were right in some sense that you need a radius, you need an angle, you need the widths. All of these things are complications of this chart that we don't really want to think about. And polar coordinates are this beautiful thing that, that scientists developed and mathematicians that basically take care of this for us. So as long as our grammar can account for this idea, this abstract idea of polar coordinates of angles of radius, we just need to think what we also need to combine from either geometries or position or, or scales. Um, can you think of a, a reason to want to change the scale of this? So let's say that this will work with the linear scale, um, but what would happen if we applied like a logarithmic scale to, to this chart? I guess I would argue that it won't intrinsically make it uninterpretable. Yeah, so I guess, uh, which will hopefully make it, make it clearer. Um, but a, another way to actually draw this um, is probably something you all would be much more familiar with and much easier to think of how all of these components work. I don't know if I got the number of bars right, but do, do both of these, this bar chart and that polar chart, convey the same information? 
or could they convey the same information? And why might we want to use one over the other? So, so they do convey the same information. Um, this is bars with potentially a linear scale. But in this representation, you can imagine that a logarithmic scale isn't as troublesome. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting that most people think that the more complex circle might be harder to interpret with a more complex scale. Um, but it can be designed such that the logarithmic scale only affects the radius, which is similar to the heights of the bars, and that, that makes, makes sense. Um, but is this a situation where we would see something with like normal bar chart and then we just transform it into a sort of symmetric uh, representation of that? Or like, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll show the code and hopefully it'll be, it'll be clear. Um, that is what you do given that you have an implementation of the grammar of graphics. I guess that's kind of the asterisk is all of these things are possible and easy given that you're working in this framework of the grammar of graphics of which ggplot and ggplot2 are implementations of them. And if if, the, uh, if we do that, if it's like a, if it's like a bar, bar graph or bar chart, usually with a bar chart, you just have one, uh, one kind of uh, variable. I guess you have bins and you have like counts, right? But then the, in the bar chart it's encoding, it's just the height of each bar that matters. And then each bar is its own kind of unit. In this, uh, this circle graph, um, the, like, uh, the width, the width of the bar chart in the regular bar chart doesn't matter, but wouldn't we care about that here? Because what would we need, wouldn't we need that to map the radius to like not just make the thing longer, but also you know make the angle wider to signify like more, more uh, like a bigger bigger number? Yeah, so you could, but you don't have to. I would argue you can do the same thing to the bar chart. You can make a bar chart with variable width bars right. and convey exactly the same information. So there's no more additional dimensions that are able to be visualized with the polar chart yeah. as the bar chart. Well, um, I guess um, to rephrase what I'm asking, it's like uh, that very, that chart, is that something where the, the encoding would be like the height of the, of the slice, the, the radius of the slice is encoding one piece of information and the width of the, width of the slice also is encoding information. So you have, you have two, uh, two variables. Yeah, I would say you 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 can, but you don't have to. Um, yeah, I guess the the answer is the answer that you can do the same for most of the charts that we're comfortable with. And the only reason we don't do that is because the convention of how we know to read a bar chart is that all the bars are the same width. Um, so it's not necessarily anything in the grammar of graphics or in the visual encoding. It's more in these um, just common conventions that all of us agree to follow as visual communicators. Um, and that's something that is kind of this underlying theme that we don't really explicitly talk about, but the reason why a bar chart and a histogram are actually something that people say conveys more information is not, um, or it's based on this assumption that we as people encounter them more often so we know what they mean. Um, and there's a lot of charts that people don't use purely for the social aspect because they're very hard to interpret. And that's something that we'll see when we get into, especially um, like week six and seven, when we talk about things like how do you visualize networks and how do you visualize hierarchical representations? Um, there's some um, visualizations that convey an incredible amount of information, but they're so densely packed that people don't use them because no one knows how to read them um, as a long answer to a short question. But um, I guess back to just to, to end this whole section, um, reason why we would want to use the polar graph versus the bar graph. 
assuming they convey the same information. So after this, this lengthy answer, the polar chart and the bar chart don't convey any more information than the other, but there is a reason to use the polar chart versus the bar chart depending on the type of data you have. Mm -hmm. So specifically degrees, and this is actually the most common way that people visualize um, like wind in, in, some, in some meteorological charts. It's the magnitude of wind over the course of a day in each of the directions. Um, other, other things about the polar chart that are different or unique, what other types of data besides geographically 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is getting, conveying some aspects of what a pie chart conveys um, in different ways. In this case, the radius is fixed. Um, and I guess a th there's a third, a third one that may not be super obvious. What else looks like a circle like this? <laughs> Clocks. So people um, visualize not clocks, but cyclic data. So you can imagine that things like a year, if we want to visualize patterns over a year, I'll, I'll bring one up and uh, it's one of my favorites. But that, that concludes the very general, broad um, grammar of graphics abstract lecture. But now we actually get to see what this looks like in code, what this looks like in Python, and hopefully have a more visceral understanding of this. So I'm going to actually go through some live code in, um, in Bokeh, which is a Python library that kind of follows this. But again, it's not, it's not exactly um, the same. And then we'll break in, yeah, I'll, I'll do 15 minutes of this, and then we'll break for the hands-on lab. Um, Again, this side of the room is section one. Um, assuming that everyone always sits, I don't think anyone sat in any different places throughout the course so far, except you. Um, but you can stay in section two. This will be section one. It really doesn't matter which section you are. So the lab is a... Um, a hands-on exercise that just basically walks you through doing your own exploratory analysis, in this case of that Airbnb data. And um, if, do you have a computer? All right, um, so we're actually gonna pair for the lab. So the lab's gonna be you pairing with, for this first class, probably the person immediately next to you. Um, I think everyone Yes, everyone, if they go to the person directly next to them in pairs, it should all work out with actually no exceptions. So in the lab, we'll be pairing and you'll be submitting the, um, the lab, I guess, uh, participation um, through GitHub, through a gist. And again, it's not graded, it's not homework. The, the main focus is the projects. But for this, 
lab. It's going to be giving you the tools to actually find interesting things to visualize and work with data in, in Python, in this case. And that'll go for an hour and a half while I'll walk around and, and help everyone out.